Don't you want Papa's everywhere to have a happy Father's Day and not a sad Father's Day? Well, our friends at Manscaped want to help with that with a toolbox of toys in the bathroom shed. And dads like saving money so you can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code BATBOOK. Now, we know dads love lawn care, and the Performance Package 4.0 has all the right gear to maintain that front yard. Included is the Lawnmower 4.0, which whips around the hills and creates a smooth, short, grassy knoll. Martha got one for her husband on their honeymoon, and look what happened. We got a Cape Crusader. After the lawn, you have to clip the weeds, and the Weed Whacker trims those hard-to-reach annoyances in your nose and ears. Talia bought one for her dad, and he feels reborn. And if you're looking for comfort, the Boxers 2.0 are packed with revolutionary features like the Jewel Pouch, which cradles the boys in their own special space. It's such a breakthrough in undergarments, you'd think Luke Fox's dad created it himself. So whether it's for your dad, your husband, or yourself, take care of lawn care this Father's Day at manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with the code BATBOOK. B-A-T-B-O-O-K, BATBOOK. You've eaten Gotham's wealth, its spirit, but your feast is nearly over. This is the blood hole. It's an operating table. And I'm the surgeon. Why aren't you laughing? From this moment on, none of you are safe. Welcome to the Batman Book Club, a podcast exploring the Dark Knight Library. I am your host, Ryan Lauer. The Batman Book Club is a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network, hosted by Batman on Film. Just go to batmanonfilm.com, click on podcasts, and you'll find the Batman Podcast Network that has a whole list of other Bat-related shows that also love to dive into other nerdy subjects we all love to frolic about in our free time. Batman Book Club is also on Patreon. If you like what's going on with the show, and you want to help support the show, keep the generators running in the Wayne Manor study, you can do that at patreon.com slash the Batman BC. Uh, joining me for this uh, tale of duality, for this facial confrontation, uh, is uh, a g- the gentleman's gentleman. I think the closest that we could get to a real life Clark Kent, and he is also someone who keeps Paul Herman on a short leash on the comic binge, it is the <laughs> one and only Mr. Chris Clow. Chris Thank you so much for coming on the show. Ryan, I am thrilled to be here. And I know that that is a commonly spoken podcast pleasantry, but it is absolutely (laughs) the case. Uh, What you have created in this show is just like the single most engaging kind of podcast topic and just also just a great title. So kudos to you on that. And I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation. I'm going to shut off my video so you don't see me blushing. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, very kind words. Uh, very nice of you to say. Uh, you and I have fortunately gotten to talk um, a podcast together. Uh, we got to do on the comic binge uh, a couple of times with Paul, that rascal, Um you and I, oh man, I, you and I got to talk with Ryan Haas in the Batman on Film podcast after that first, the Batman trailer at Fandom. Right. Yeah. That was a good time. Oh, I know we've been on a podcast prior to that and stuff too, but it was, this was uh, something I, I did not purposely mean to wait 108 episodes to get you on, <laughs> but I'm glad that everything lined up and, and here we are. Look, it's okay. I mean, it, they're, the Batman library is so large and so <laughs> yeah. vast that uh, I figured you would come around to me eventually, so it's no yeah. worries there. Plus, the, 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 the caliber of your guests is always very high, so I, am, uh, I feel fortunate to be counted among them. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. Um, before we dig into the, the book of choice, I've got to ask you, since this is your first time on this show... Chris Clow, what is your favorite Batman story? It's such a, I, I mean, having listened to the show, I knew that question was coming, but <laughs> it really doesn't matter because every time I am asked that, it is very loaded, as I'm sure you can understand, and probably anybody listening to this. Can. It's a long Halloween. 
I don't know what you're talking about. It's pretty simple. <laughs> well, there you pretty go. simple Isn't, question. <laughs> if you if you got it locked and loaded, then that's great. No, I mean, if I have to try and kind of boil it down to a prototypical story that maybe I subconsciously can't help but compare other Batman stories to, mm. then I guess it's year one. Uh, year one to me is such a potent distillation of everything that I love about who I have often called my favorite character in fiction that, uh, I mean, I'm forced to bow to its greatness to quote Bruce Wayne and kingdom come. I, I bow, you know, um, <laughs> to, to the eternal wisdom. Um, just year one. I love how, um, how grounded it is. And I know that mm -hmm. that's a commonly used phrase, but there's something that has to be said, especially coming during an era right on the heels of such a, a multiversal shakeup in terms of the DC Comics universe. Getting back to the basics of the major characters was one of the great initiatives that the post-crisis era had at the very beginning. And using a story that is as intimate as year one is to build out the pivotal dynamic between Bruce Wayne and Jim Gordon, uh, while also proving to Gordon that there is... Uh, a sort of higher good that does exist uh, in the form of Batman. It's a story that gets to me every time. The moment that immediately jumps out at me is just when Jim is, is struggling to save a homeless man. And right before he can't get there, Batman's there. And it just speaks to his reverence for all of the innocent lives that live in Gotham City and his desire and willingness to uh, to maintain order by helping people. You know, it's not like, I think it's Batman is often misunderstood as a punitive character when, I mean, the, his defining trauma and his defining tragedy uh, put him on a path to a desire to preserve the order and to preserve life as much as possible. So if he's punitive at all, it's in defense of someone else. And I think that moment is a great encapsulation of that. That's a long answer. Sorry. That's great. But... No, I love it. Um, last year we did uh, the, the episode 50, me and some of our other uh, pals that you and I talked to of Peter Vera, Ryan Haas, Garrett Greb, we did our top 10 Batman stories and year one was my number five. And you know how lists can always fluctuate. And I kind of feel like that's a, that that's as far as that one will probably ever drop for me is number five uh, because I mean it's it's really funny because fans now there's always like oh man that one-two punch from Frank Miller of Dark Knight Returns and year one and yet it's it's never hesitation for me that I'm always I don't know I'm like no year one to me is better than Dark Knight Returns it's even though nice. he's there's not much Batman in like Batman in year one but that doesn't matter to me it's no. such a it's a better story yeah I spoke several years ago now, probably back in like 2016. I have a podcast called Comics on Consoles. That, yeah, you do. Um, that, you know, the intersection between comics and video games where capes meet controllers. <laughs> yes. Um, and my guest, I, I, I profiled a rather terrible video game called Batman Dark Tomorrow that came out in 2003 on the GameCube and the PS2. But um, even though it wasn't a very good game the story was phenomenal and yeah, i never was, got to play that one you should just kind of absorb the story because playing it is an exercise in madness probably but okay. the the cinematics mm -hmm. it was the single most truthful to comics vision of batman i had ever seen represented in another medium up to that point mm. and the story was written by a comic book writer named scott peterson who i was fortunate enough to have as a guest and he kind of spoke about what you mentioned like there's not a lot of batman in that story comparatively at least you know when you're looking directly at something like dkr but his presence is there like the the thing that's that scott told me that i think is so true is that when you're in new york city you don't always need to be looking at the empire state building to know that its presence is felt wow, you know, that's, it's, it's nice felt in the architecture and it's felt in just like this kind of overriding uh visual aesthetic of the entire place and um and i think that's batman's 
like there's a lot of great batman stories or even just dc stories that operate that way when it comes to batman but Mm -hmm. your one is certainly there but i would not even presume to question you in comparing dkr and your one to me your one is hands down the superior story not to take away from dkr's importance it's a very important story and it's an important story to a lot of people Mm -hmm. but when i'm looking for a definitive batman story that one's actually kind of far down the list because it's it, it doesn't always encapsulate everything that i personally love about the character because it's more concerned with um with showing a bruce wayne at the end of his rope and at the end of his life when he has been overcome by a, de- a degree of cynicism there is still some hope to be found there but it's funny compared uh, you know considering the story that we're talking about tonight primarily dkr probably had a lot of undue influence on uh several years worth of batman stories leading up to this one that we're talking about and that's also weirdly enough one of the reasons i like this one as much as i do that's like a perfect transition you had a great answer uh great reasoning for your answer and now a great lead into the book of choice tonight today whenever you're listening to this of batman face the face now this was written by james robinson illustrated by don kramer uh, it ran through detect back and forth between detective comics 817 through 820 and batman 651 to 654 released back in 2006 it's been released in issue uh, physical issues trade paperback a deluxe edition hardcover a few years ago it's available digitally it's available on dc universe infinite and it's available on my favorite app of all time hoopla uh mr cloud for this episode which version did you read i actually alternated um between the issues as available on dc universe and my copy of the trade paperback that i purchased at the comic book store that i was employed at uh from 2007 to 2013 um so uh i i just kind of bounced around because i just feel like you get a different sense Mm -hmm. of of a story uh when you're holding it tangibly but then the ability to enhance the highlights and to take a deep look at the line work in the digital format, I find beneficial too. So on a deep dive that I sometimes like to engage in, I'll, I'll be a mutt and, and <laughs> go both ways. Uh, it's funny because Peter Vera will champion us for grabbing physical. Justin Kowalski would champion us for going digital but I agree with you in the sense of, and I think I told it to Justin once on, uh, on one of our recordings that something about physically with me, like it's, I like, I don't know. I get more into the story and I do better at reading it as opposed to just on a screen. Cause I'm looking at screens of everything quickly every day to where as a physical copy of a book, uh, I don't know. I just absorb it better. So that's why I grabbed my trade paperback as well that I bought from my college bookstore when it was first released. <laughs> yeah. A lot of kids going in there for textbooks and I'm like, shit, I should probably get a text. Hey, look at this, this Batman book right here. Yeah. Let's do that instead. But then I also, because that's just the regular uh, trade paperback that was printed. I'll check to make sure, but yeah, I think this first printing in 2006 Yep, in 2006, but also I checked out the deluxe edition on Hoopla digitally, so that there's a very specific reason when we get to it later on why I did that, but also I wanted to see if there was much like extras included or anything, and I actually just think the deluxe edition is a larger format physically, whereas you're not missing out on much if you got it, uh, the deluxe edition digitally or the old version digitally, etc. Now, do you remember the first time that you read this i do off the rack right off the rack from the get-go uh so over a period of four months um alternating between batman and detective really the um i read comics as a kid Mm -hmm. um i remember buying jla number one by grant morrison and howard porter off the rack uh at a convenience store uh in 1997 um 
just kind of caught up in the hype i think leading up to batman and robin when i was nine so um but i also oh, that movie saw, yeah yeah <laughs> that flick okay but i mean i i love the justice league i've always been a dc kid um mm-hmm. but i fell off naturally through uh you know middle and most of high school and i jumped back into reading comics full bore my uh my senior year and i jumped in at a very um either opportune or inopportune time back into full-time comics because infinite crisis was going on um so i kind of started i think it was like two or three and um the comic shop i was going to that i would eventually end up working at a couple of years later uh said hey this is the big uh the big event that's kind of steering the ship at dc right now do you want to want to check it out we've got one and two over there and i was like yeah okay sure and i mean i didn't know what the hell was going on Mm -hmm. um i had a loose understanding of crisis on infinite earths so there were some connections to be made but you know batman was knee deep in managing the uh the the omac virus that spun out of brainiac tech with brother eye and uh and this, the the entire story just had kind of this undertone of uh, of a kind of darkness that needed to be overcome. But say what you will about the complexity of the story, it was compelling to me when I was reading it, and I it just kind of made me want to dive into okay, so what what is the recent history here? Let's back up a bit. Let's figure out what the status quo is with all of these major players. And Infinite Crisis really did lead me not just with uh, with Batman, but to go back with Superman, with Wonder Woman, with the Green Lantern Corps, um, with the Hawks to a certain degree. That was the first time that I had started to uh, think about reading books with Adam Strange. Um, it was like a tour de force of the DCU, but naturally because of my uh, gravitation toward Batman, that's what I paid most attention to. So um I think a few years before I had at the library read Hush because I think everybody read Hush. Like that mm-hmm. was the story that just broke into mainstream acceptance very quickly because of the, the Jim Lee artwork. I mean, DC still sells calendars with some of those mm-hmm. covers uh, to this day. Uh, so I had had some loose familiarity with Hush, but it was really at that point that I started to develop a, a far deeper understanding of Batman's post-crisis history and all of the major events that had led up to the likes of Infinite Crisis up through Under the Hood, which is, you know, took place right before this in the publication timeline. Um, So when Infinite Crisis ended and one year later began, this was really my starting point in terms of following the books on a regular basis, which if I'm remembering correctly from previous episodes I've listened to, was right before you jumped on regularly. I'm glad that you asked because I was a few reasons I was excited that you chose this. And one was because, yes, this actually was when I got into regular, like following regularly. It tracks back to uh, my family, not me, uh, it's like my parents, uh, aunt and uncles, and the grandparents all were, went on a cruise and when they were in the airport in Miami my mom actually saw a spinner rack with some Batman comics and just was like you know parents will get you souvenirs and she was like oh cool it's Batman and it was the final chapter of this book which I think was Batman 654 yes uh that was the last chapter of this one Batman 655 I think 656 and then Legends of the Dark Knight to she definitely got me 210, which is the darker than death storyline. That's also one of my favorite stories. So she brings back like four or five Batman comic book issues and just said, I liked how some of these looked on the front and it's also Batman. So here you go. That was the kick in the ass to start like, oh, 654. So I read the very last part of the story first, but then had to go to a comic shop and think of buying the, you know, each chapter. And then I ended up going to my, the books, the college campus bookstore and saw this and realized, oh, that's what this is. So I first read it right when the trade, I read it as the trade, as soon as the trade came out. 
which would have been, you know, like September maybe of 2006, um, something like that. And then, yeah, and then that a good memory because, yeah, that, anybody listening, Batman 655, that was the beginning of Grant Morrison's arc. And yeah, I jumped in on the very beginning of the Grant Morrison arc, and then I've followed ever since. So I'm at going to 16 years this year. Woo! <laughs> That's awesome. But Good it's great. To jump in face to face like it's it stands out to me because of that you know that issue and it's like yep it was in that that pack of four or five comics that got me got me going uh and here i am sitting with chris Cloud these years later <laughs> talking face to face so speaking of face to face when i asked you would you like to come on the show and you said you gotta pay me uh <laughs> Oh no, the secret. Then I, out. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I'm broke. I need some help. Um, but no, no, no. You you had a couple of options and then you came up with face to face. So why face to face? Uh this in a lot of ways, like I there are nits to pick, certainly. Sure. But in addition to being a, a story that I associate with my early uh, time as a regular monthly reader uh, so fondly at least um, there's a really I believe wonderful sense of um, of coming home in this story because not only is this taking place a year after Infinite Crisis after Batman Robin and Nightwing have retraced Bruce's original steps around the world um, as you know, you saw them leave on that trip at the very tail end of Infinite Crisis. Um, but there's a lot of just general return of, I'm going to say the word trappings, even though I feel like that could have a negative connotation and I don't think they're trappings, but the trappings of definitive Batman stories. For a long time before this, and um, you know, shortly after I started becoming a regular reader of the monthlies, and as I ravenously grabbed what was then the relatively recent, like 50 issues preceding this point, like back into the middle of Ed Brubaker's run on the title, there had been a noticeable descent into, at the time, I think it was kind of uh, colloquially referred to as a hole Batman, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, you know, he's so harsh and unforgiving in a lot of ways, inspired by DKR, I feel anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like that kind of comes through in the way that the character was written. Um, he was becoming more paranoid. They uh, answered that at a universe-wide way, inter very interestingly, in Identity Crisis uh, and the things that spin out of Identity Crisis. But it wasn't just Bruce Wayne himself that was growing, I think, unnecessarily darker. It was the state of his allies. It was uh, it was the city itself, and it was the kinds of um, the kinds of things that other characters in Batman's orbit were facing. I love Gotham Central. I think Gotham Central is a spectacular ongoing series uh, that ended far too soon, but. Some of that was evident in Gotham Central. You know, Gordon had resigned as the police commissioner after Officer Down. Bullock's uh, descent into outright corruption led very nearly to his personal ruin and death. Uh, it was just a dark time for Gotham City. Then Infinite Crisis comes along, and in, it, within universe, it seems like it gives a lot of people who inhabited the DC universe kind of a new appreciation for life and bruce wayne was among those people so the thing that still just gets to me about reading this uh today is that batman himself and robin and even members of the the police department they feel kind of rested understandably so but they also feel newly dedicated and just a little bit lighter a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more understanding without ever compromising the integrity of who each character is supposed to be. It's like a, 
it's very much a perfect jumping on point at the time Mm -hmm. i feel but it's also a bit of a tonal reset coming off of uh of some of the messed up things that batman had had to deal with in the years prior really ever since uh bruce wayne murderer really huh now but okay whoo no but i think i think you hit it I hit the nail on the head because, which is funny, ironically, because the like the look of the book is like it is dark, but yes, Batman and Robin are more hopeful, for sure. Uh, there's, I don't know, he he definitely feels a little bit more heroic, and yeah, like you said with Bruce Wayne murderer and stuff and. Like, yeah, that just, I don't know. It feels like such a pit to crawl out of to try and see some glimmer of light, you know, whereas this, of course, it's all like night and it's, you know, I'm speaking poetically, but like um, (laughs) here definitely is like, he's the hero trying to solve a case and trying to save Harvey Dent, you know, and stuff and stuff like that as a human and like, we'll get you help and stuff. And so, yeah, the a-hole Batman is kind of gone. You kind of, helped i guess describe a little bit i wanted to ask you so it's actually really funny because this was a jumping on point but what i would see about this book and these issues and stuff is that this is batman one year later so i was trying to track i was like oh my gosh i missed everything that came right before this i had under the hood the like the two volume trades uh that i'd read and then it was like, I, I did, I looked up and I'm like, wait, hold on. This came right after under the hood. Where's the one year stuff? What am I missing? Where's the one year? And then to find out it was kind of like a, a tie in for all DC characters. So kind of in summary, what, what is the one year later? Um, what would you call it? Like series connectivity? I, I don't know. Label. Initiative? Some of these? There you go. Initiative. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I mean, I love One Year Later. Uh, this kind of inspired me to go back and look at some of those other stories. Um, again, I think Superman's One Year Later story is is excellent. It was co-written by Jeff Johns and Kurt Busiek. Um, and obviously we didn't really, or at least I didn't realize it at the time necessarily, but this, the one year was filled in by the 52 weekly series. Uh, which is something that I did keep up with at the time. I was going and picking it up every week and reading it. I did not because I was like, there is no way I can afford and keep up with 52 weekly issues of a comic. And then only for a couple years later for them to do Batman Eternal. And I said, there's no way I am not going to buy every <laughs> issue and read every issue. <laughs> you know, um, I and I totally get that perspective. And I it, it didn't really... I think when I bought the first one, I didn't realize that it was coming out every week until uh, I reached the end of it and it said, see you next week. And I went, oh, yeah. okay. Well, I've um, started. I can't jump ship now. <laughs> right, yeah. And But the conceit for 52, I am so thankful that that series came out when it did, particularly for me, because I jumped on with Infinite Crisis and then these one year later books came out and 52 was coming out to fill it in. But 52 is such a tour de force of the entire DCU without the trinity you know so any blind spots that you have coming in as a pretty fresh reader without really knowing who the trinity are Mm -hmm. you're going to learn these characters and live with them across the entirety of the dcu if you go on that weekly journey so but then you know you start to learn as the series goes on that oh you do get some hints about what batman and robin and nightwing and clark kent and diana prince were up to during that time so whenever that stuff came around it was always really fascinating but i actually found the break when all the one year later issues came out to be a really perfect and natural jumping on point yes the i think the people who are predisposed to reading comics like you and i um are like well what happened we have to figure out what happened before so we can jump in without you know missing a beat but i think the one year later initiative was a good way to say look we don't know what happened before yet so go along for the ride and we'll tell you when we figure it out yeah um 
So it was, it was a clean break. And because it was a clean break, it made it really easy to realize, oh, I don't know what's going on being dropped in the middle of this one year later, but neither do they. So most of the time, there were a couple of instances that might have gone off the rails a little bit, but most of the time when you jumped into a one year later book, um, it wasn't nearly as disorienting as it could be, at least I thought. Mm-hmm. No, and I mean, that's a strength at least written here um, too is, yes, there is that question of kind of like, oh, Batman, you're back. Uh, you've been gone for a year. Period. So his, yeah. this is what's going on now. Poison Ivy's taking over a building. Hey, I didn't need to know what happened a month ago in Gotham to know that Poison Ivy's taken over a building. Like, it, it, like it's, it is a good jumping on point but i mean just looking up really quick i did on hoopla and hoopla has got the um volumes one and two of 52 and it's got infinite crisis i think it's just begging for begging for me to read it to check them out thank you hoopla um yeah so i think to start this book off and i mean we mentioned dark knight returns early on tell me it's not just me that the beginning of the first chapter of this book totally feels Dark Knight Returns. You know, I got a little more of a year one vibe off of it. You did. Do tell. Literally because Gordon's in bed and he's having trouble sleeping, you know? I mean, Mm -hmm. that's just such a clear callback to, uh, obviously he doesn't have a pregnant wife sleeping next to him this time, but it was just such a clear visual callback and it didn't have any of the um i guess the emotional baggage that i often associate with dark knight returns it's just it's a heavy book right and i think this creates a contrast with that experience because really for an eight issue story none of this feels burdensome at least i feel i feel like it's a pretty breezy read and at the beginning, when it drops you in, uh, I can see what you mean structurally because it's like setting the table for what Gotham is like here. Uh, and when you do that in a one-off story or in a story separate from the main continuity like they did in, in DKR, that's probably arguably more important to do. Um, so structurally, I think you're absolutely correct. And I wouldn't presume to, 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 uh, to challenge that or debate that. Um, But just in terms of the overall feel, um, and maybe, you know, maybe I'm not approaching this as objectively as I could, um, but that's okay, at least to me. (laughs) But uh, you're wrong. It it feels, um, it feels like you're on the cusp of a sunrise. It feels like you're on the, you're about to go on an adventure like you're not being dropped necessarily into like a a, an emotionally withering csi episode as much as you're about to you're about to see your hero come back so i I think i think for me the the link is almost like we're teased of his return Uh, like right at the beginning you get a sense of who gordon talks to on the phone and you're like, oh, he's he's back. And then you get the signal in the sky. You get the reactions of people that see the signal in the sky. And to me, that does, I thought, and maybe it's not in the first chapter, but he's talking like off panel to Harvey uh, at some point. And that just what sparked with me of like, oh, they're building up for, and then you do get the two-page spread where him and Robin uh, are, yeah. are on the, the signal. So that that's just where I got that feeling. And actually, I did think year one, but maybe not in how you'd expect. I thought year one and how Harvey's dressed. Okay, yeah. Like sure. he looks like Drifter Bruce from year one, you know? Ooh, and yeah, he absolutely does. Men for decades have worn stocking caps with coats. Like it's <laughs> it's not like he's like, Did you catch that? Oh, Ryan's the only one who thought of it. No, no, no. It's just I was like, oh, okay, that kind of looks all right. Um, it does it creates a sense of anticipation for finally seeing him which mm-hmm. um yeah that is descended from from dkr absolutely i mean it, it it's probably a little bit more uh feverish in dkr than it is here because it feels i guess smoother 
if that makes sense in this sure. story. But um, no, I totally see where you're coming from. And they did a pretty good job of, uh, of the pacing. I think that, so if I'm remembering correctly, well, I don't need to remember correctly. I have a <laughs> um, so the, the odd chapters were laid out by Leonard Kirk and they were finished by Andy Clark. And uh, the even chapters were penciled by Don Kramer. Um, really interesting and different styles, especially with a, a Kirk Clark collaboration. Um, but you see Clark a lot in the, the details, especially on the faces. But yeah, this, this first one, um, it's funny because you mentioned before how the entire thing is still in a dark environment while still feeling like a lighter story. Yeah. And, uh, and that's absolutely the case because it's, it's Gotham, of course, but it's the writing that helps to inform a bit of a lighter tone, but I love the layouts too. Like, and I know people aren't going to be able to see this, but there's a page rather early on where Batman and Gordon are silhouetted against the bat signal I just love this image and it's not only is it classic and and iconic but it's just really evocative of uh of the sort of the thematic aims of the story but i see where you're coming from and i agree with you and i just uh i love this book (laughs) (laughs) let's just say that the next half hour i love this book yes yeah it's pretty good no i do spoiler alert right but i mean i think um one of the things that I love and appreciate about it is James Robinson. Mm-hmm. He is historically a workhorse in the comics industry. Um, he would go on shortly after, or a couple of years after this, to becoming a regular collaborator on the Superman titles. Um, but unfortunately, he also has a track record of not being treated very well by the publisher, uh, which I don't understand why they do that. He was kind of... Uh, blindsided during a superman run with the imposition of the new krypton story that he was not planning for when he took the book over Hmm. um so he's a guy that i think is just reliable he understands the characters really well i said there were some nits to pick i feel like his voice for batman is a little too formal in some cases i don't know if if uh if batman sounds uh as as formal in my own head as he does in this story at times but um just in general his reliability and his understanding of the characters made him a really effective uh writer in terms of actually bringing this story to life i think what you said that i i really enjoy is the flow and pacing of this of this book because i started reading it so we're recording on Wednesday and I think it was Friday. I was like, okay, it's eight issues. I should start now because, you know, just to just slowly get, and I mean, I was done Sunday. It was like two sittings and I went through both sittings really quick because I, the book, it does just flow. And uh, it's crazy to think about what is worked into the story in those eight issues and what flows and i love the the switch in the storytelling of the lesser known villains of ventriloquist orca kg beast magpie um (laughs) us bat fans we know who they are they're not joker or riddler uh by any means but they're more crucial to the story than other villains that are in this story quickly of poison ivy mad hatter killer croc scarecrow like those are more a-list rogues but they're it's it's like a a cool switch of they have good cameos of kind of giving batman and robin something to do and it's fun for us to open the page and see that's who they're taking down while the ones spoiler alert of you know the the other four of ventriloquist magpie orca and kgb that's where this the uh, uh the case is at the murder case who murdered these people and signs are pointing toward it being oh it's two two shots to the head long halloween um 
but equal distance apart and you know like that it's like that's where the case is and i i, I like that in reading this because i mean it's been a couple of years since i've read this um i've read this probably I, I can't tell you how many times but it's always scattered so everything feels a little fresh i remember that last chapter pretty damn well though <laughs> <laughs> but i think and that's a credit to to robinson there and how he's fit i just there's something about that part that i really enjoy and how we get these um I, I don't know the lesser known ones get the get more of the um importance factor yeah absolutely i mean you want a a batman comic story to potentially lean on what separates the medium from others that the character appears in mm-hmm. and by calling out kg beast and magpie uh i mean i I think I personally put ventriloquist a little bit higher than them just because he, he's like, yeah he I, I've always gravitated toward Arnold Wesker to, to I don't know why I just have always kind of latched on to him I think that he's he used to be a ventriloquist you know as a side yeah, job yeah yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly um but no like uh these are characters that will probably like well BBS came along but not as KG Beast right Mm-hmm. probably only appear in the books um so why not make use of them especially if it's it, you're going to ease batman back into the groove of of actively working in gotham on a regular basis again and operating in gotham as batman again um so it's cool to see these kinds of callbacks and for one person or another who reads this is their long time readers i mean that's might be someone's favorite villain i don't know mm-hmm. any of those people but it might be i mean magpie just still sticks out in my head because when i was doing my deep dive into the uh in, into the post-crisis history of the dc universe first meeting between batman and superman at that point was over magpie uh in, in man of steel by john Byrne, number four so magpie just stuck out of my head for that reason alone but um my you know, cool. birth issue uh is the debut of magpie so the one that that's cover date is november of um november 1986 batman 401 magpie her name is magpie that's my tie to magpie (laughs) hey and that makes perfect sense uh i mean gosh which one was that you said uh number 401 401 okay yeah. so for me it must have been 414 I guess, 414 which let's see was thank you google it? starlin apero cover date <sighs> december of 87 uh, you sir december of 87 yeah that's cool i mean but... you you got the better issue <laughs> <laughs> No well, offense to Barbara Kessel and Trevor Von Eden, but uh, <laughs> and Magpie, but I think you got the better issue. But um, it wasn't too long after uh, the post-crisis origin of Jason Todd. But um, shout it, out to our friend Paul. It yeah. totally explains my, um, what do you want to say? My appreciation for fishnet stockings. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, everybody has something. Uh, has their in to, yeah. <laughs> to those kinds of characters. I, I like yours the best though. <laughs> but I mean, I like when comic stories do things that can only really be done in comics. And I especially mm-hmm. like that from Batman because he's a character that's been adapted so many times. If you can do something to make your story stand out, do it. Uh, you know, rise above the pack. It's one of the reasons I love Grant Morrison's run as much as I do. Uh, you never saw it before. You'll never see it again. But, um, you know, in this case, uh, leaning on those lesser used villains, because they probably didn't have a long term plan for any of those characters. I would be really surprised if they did. Um, So make use of them. It was Mm -hmm. pretty good use. One thing I will say, because you brought up um, just the structure and how it alternated between Batman and Detective, reading it this time. One thing that I did kind of feel is that there should have been a third title that it crossed over with. It should have crossed over with Robin because really 
what happens in this book for Tim Drake is so earth shattering and uh, at like a foundational level, like not to take away. I like Adam Beechin's run on Robin quite a bit. Uh, and I was reading it as it came out. Um, but it does seem like readers of that book and to a lesser degree, maybe other books that Robin was taking part in like teen Titans would have benefited from seeing sure. what his first time back in Gotham was like, and what happened at the end of the book. That's a good point. Well, yeah. So there's a lot of avenues I want to travel, but let's go just as you talk about Robin, I, because bat the Batman books and Hey, I was in college when this, when this came out, funding was limited so i did stick to buying batman and detective and then if i had some scraps of extras it would be start like building up the archives of trades you know but it was this was a way i could stay up to date with the current stuff while venturing into the old because we didn't have uh you know we didn't have dc universe then hoopla wasn't around can you believe that a time when hoopla wasn't around um but did i mean batman jumped in right into the morrison run so did much happen after the revelation at the end of this book that's teased a little bit throughout from from bruce of that he adopted tim drake like did they do much with that in like the in the robin book they they dealt with it a little bit but it was not like a a centerpiece okay component of the story as far as i can tell at least during that time probably the biggest impact that that practically had was just putting tim in the same place as damien when damien showed up for the first time um but just considering like I, I mean, I talked a lot before about how really ever since Bruce Wayne murderer, the character had just kind of descended yeah. into this uh, into this darker abyss that he needed to find a way out of. And that is most definitely true of Tim Drake. Um, not only in his own title did he have a lot of things to deal with and up to and including uh, abdicating the role of Robin very briefly to Stephanie Brown and Stephanie's death right after that, but the deaths of his parents, the death of his mm -hmm. best friend in Infinite Crisis. Uh, there's a great Superboy Prime cameo in here via a Scarecrow hallucination in the story that I thought was really cool. Um, but Tim had endured a lot and Tim needed a break. Mm -hmm. And throughout the entire thing, or most of this story, Batman says as much, you know, he says as much to Alfred, he says as much in internal monologue. And Tim is a character certainly then but maybe even more now just because he's not as visible as he used to be there's so much goodwill for tim drake among the fan base and i think a lot of people felt like you're putting this kid through the ringer and he yeah. needs a break you know the, in the one year later issue of teen titans it ends with him uh like trying to figure out how to clone his best friend again and bring him back uh you know damning the consequences of the fact that bringing a person back doesn't work like that yeah and he had to get that kind of beaten into him by cassie sands mark later on but i mean this kid had been through so much uh over the past several years especially with identity crisis that this kind of new legitimacy as a member of the wayne family which is probably something that paid off more by the time you got to the red robin ongoing um, but it was, I, I felt like it was a very emotional moment, especially when I read it at the time. Um, and I liked how Robinson weaved in the idea that the laws have changed. You can't be my ward anymore, mm -hmm. but the, uh, additional emotional weight that comes with, but you can be my son is, uh, is pretty immense. And I think, I felt similarly at the time and now still to a lot of fans who were a little shocked at how quote unquote badly Tim was being treated just in terms of what he went through, that it was just, it was really nice to see 
yeah this recognition uh by batman himself and becoming a new member of the wayne family so it's not that especially once we ended up seeing the longevity of grant morrison's run and the plans that he had i don't think that he needed to be anchored to um like this and it's like no this needs to play a huge factor in your story but i almost feel like it to me because of just the you know the the two books i was reading i felt like this is a big moment that's how you ended the last issue before morrison starts his run he's pushed aside enter bruce wayne's real like biological son now that's the focus and i'm like oh you guys kind of you sidelined this big this big deal and yeah and i haven't i mean there's a lot more that i haven't read than i have of of you know uh tim drake's um it, it issues he appeared in after this revelation and stuff you know that i was just really i was curious i'm like well i'm gonna definitely ask chris if they really got their money's worth on that on that moment in further issues of tim drake's stories there so if i'm remembering correctly and it's been a while since i've revisited it but uh there were several issues in beechin's run on robin where being a wayne gives him additional access to things that help him in his investigations um and it kind of changes the you you see it a little bit in this story too but certainly in issues of robin it, it kind of changes the dynamic of tim's relationship to bruce there's something that is more casually accept not that bruce never had confidence in tim he always had confidence in him to to one degree or another but there was like this new casual kind of acceptance that you sort of start to see glimpsed in this story that would inform their future interactions. And I don't disagree with you that, you know, bringing Damien in and the, the, the primary Batman monthly uh, did potentially undercut uh, what this issue was doing or what mm -hmm. the story did in terms of turning Tim into Bruce's uh, legal son. Uh but I do think that there was enough there for them to build on later that it justified it. In addition to what I said before about just giving Tim a little bit of a reprieve. And also too, just in terms of the dynamics, you know, Damien did show up and he made a big splash, but then he was kind mm -hmm. of gone for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least until, you know, like RIP really started to kick in. So during that time um, in issues where Robin would appear in the bat titles and in his own book and in teen titans um he had a lot to do he had a lot to stand on in terms of just what he was doing by himself or in concert with with the titans for instance so at least in that respect damien isn't as much of a factor really until right before bruce gets taken off the board of the dc universe for a while so at least there's that yeah. and I talked about Red Robin before, and I mean, one of the primary conceits uh, surrounding Tim that Chris Yost applied to Tim um, going or coming out of the Red Robin number one was that, no, I'm going to call, call me Tim Wayne. My dad's gone. And I need to find him. No one else believes me. No one else believes that he's still out there. Um, I lost one dad. I really don't believe this one's gone and I'm not going to let him go even if you did so reverberations i guess yeah he's he's a good man that tim drake he is, he really is. <laughs> he's he's a good kid i like him uh let's talk about uh harvey 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 dent yeah uh he's i mean at the it's it's funny so one, I actually never, I kind of don't like the name, the title of the book, Face to Face. I don't know why. It's like, eh, it's okay. Okay, whatever. It's uh, even more confusing when you look at that deluxe hardcover because they added Batman Two-Face, Face to Face. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's like, I that's not, that. that's not Bruce. I mean, Bruce isn't even in this story that much. But also, that doesn't even make sense. And Bruce's face with two faces, not even Bruce and Harvey's face. It's Bruce that, 
which by the way the covers in this it's i don't know simon bianchi yeah. i don't okay amazing covers yeah like my gosh those are i oh fantastic i love and that's i was able to screenshot each one at least through hoopla um and they don't have the that's plus and a minus for screenshot wallpaper it doesn't have batman issue whatever detective issue whatever so it's a great still of oh, their like wallpaper. Covers. yeah yeah but then i also had to do like some back flipping to see wait wait wait, which issue is this you know um love those covers but it's almost like another kind of swap here because harvey is important to the story but he's not crucial for the events that happen um yeah i don't know if that explains it very well because it's definitely now it's hard for me to because i i read the damn ending before i read the whole book (laughs) <laughs> but in definitely in reading it now and rereading and stuff it's like oh yeah the breadcrumbs are there that it definitely from the first uh murder of kg beast it's like oh two two uh bullet wounds to the head equal distance apart two sh- you know what i mean uh okay yeah that's two face oh but wait it's harvey dent who also another uh connection to dark knight returns his face is recovered still yes from hush um has been since hush so at this point with this is it uh it's been like three years probably i think in batman comics that harvey dent has been fully recovered by his face but yeah so everything is lining up that it's supposed to be harvey but i mean i think you may even get a couple issues where we don't even see him and i'm I'm, i could be wrong though because i guess he is as drifter bruce wannabe um but i think what i can go back on what i said of like he's not totally crucial for the events that happen in the story but yet also at the base of the foundation of it is okay he was given this huge responsibility by batman he felt like he had importance he felt like there's i have something i have to do the city needs me and then batman comes back and basically he feels like he took that away from him and now comes the mental struggle the mental struggle and there's murders happening that look like it's harvey dent like batman's gonna batman's actually trying to defend that you're not the one while others are believing oh that's harvey it's harvey to where he does succumb to the little little demon two-face and by book's end, which is always surprising to me how big of a confrontation it actually kind of isn't, of we get Two-Face versus Batman again, I feel like it it feels very quick. But Harvey, like we're back to the status quo of Harvey, or Two-Face is back. Yeah. So and it is kind of important. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, technically speaking, but you're not, well, Paul, you're not wrong. Um, I want you to tell me I'm wrong by the time <laughs> we end our conversation. Well, okay. <laughs> no, look, I mean, look, you're, you're, you're a very, you're very competent in the way that you're approaching this. I think that really what this provided in terms of two face was a means to an end because mm-hmm. really between hush and face to face, they didn't really do anything with them. I can't no, remember. Nothing, really nothing stands any, out. No, like any instance of what, a healed Harvey Dent brought to the table for Gotham. In fact, I don't even really remember him appearing in the books at all between, was it like 619 and 654 of the main book? Maybe he showed up in Detective, I'm not sure. Those issues of Batman from post-Hush until Under the Hood, I mean, that's just one of those gaps that it's like, I, I I couldn't tell you any of them what happened in in those and i know when paul was on and we talked under the hood i did look back and see what the issues were and yeah and i've i've forgotten even because yeah, right after hush was broken city by brian that's Azzarello, right and, Azzarello. Azzarello. Mm-hmm. and then right after that it was when judd winnick came on board and winnick spent the first part of his run with scarecrow i was gonna say the crow flies. yes the crow flies which i i bought I had that trade. 
Sure. So okay. And, so then, then I'll went to Red Hood. I'll I'll go back and and be like, okay, so yes, now that you've told this, this is why I have you on. Do you want the show? <laughs> this should be your <laughs> no. show. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> you you are doing a <laughs> right. This was job. all a, would... this was all a lie at the beginning. You you are not competent enough. To no, crash. I w- I would I would crash the ship. Uh, you're uh, a, a, far more of a picture of competence. BS. Yeah. Uh, but no, there you go. So we just we just filled the gap. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time to reminisce and yeah so you do have three years at that point of a recovered harvey dent and not much was done but yeah now that makes me want to go look at detective and see what happened in detective at that gap but yeah nothing i mean face to face ends up feeling like the harvey dent story of the time the two yeah, story of the time i mean like i'm trying to think back like around 800 detective 800 i mean detective and batman both dealt with war games around Mm -hmm. like around then like maybe between like a year after or so thereabouts but um there wasn't really room for two-face i don't remember two-face or harvey i should say playing any role to speak of in war games it was kind of dominated by uh by things flying off the handle after uh matches malone became gotham's crime boss but uh so all of that to say you know we've done the archaeology now and sort of going back and at least the publication of the main title and some of detective it doesn't seem like they really knew what to do with the healed harvey dent if they sure. wanted to do anything at all so now that's not an excuse not to have him play a larger part in this story uh, because you're right, you're like com- comparatively speaking, in terms of the other things that go on, my reverence for this story personally does not come from Two Face. It comes from Batman himself, and it comes from mm-hmm. Robin, and it comes from uh, Gordon being reinstated and Bullock becoming a part of the police force again. And and really, it has far more to do with the heroes than it does with the villains. Even though it's fun to talk about Magpie and KG Beast and the Ventriloquist, but um, yeah, it just seems like. For whatever reason, after Jeff Loeb, they didn't know what to do. So having a story that accomplishes Batman's return to heroism with Robin and bringing, I mean, it brought the bat signal back. The the bat signal was taken off of the roof of police headquarters by Commissioner Aikens in Gotham Central. So not only do you have Batman, Robin, Gordon, Bullock, uh, but you have the bat signal. Like it's just such a return to to um to traditional batman storytelling in a way that we hadn't seen in so long and that's uh, such a comforting feeling too yeah i yeah. do like the uh original stories that do take you know they take you out of your comfort zone a little bit it, it exposes you to something new and it exposes you to something you didn't necessarily know that you wanted but then you can return back to oh this feels like a good old fashioned batman story <laughs> I like it both. Yeah. You can like them all. It's okay. Oh, I mean, and I mean, he know we know pretty well that he would go through some of those unsettling kinds of stories for the next several years in the hands mm-hmm. of uh, of Grant Morrison. But um, yeah, just in terms of what this story wanted to accomplish, Two Face probably wasn't very high on the list. Um, and really, it seems like DC editorial was more concerned with getting him back to a familiar status quo sure um than using harvey dent so look it was cool seeing harvey healed and hush and seeing him at the beginning i mean it still kind of weirds me out that batman trust entrusts harvey dent with overseeing gotham in the year that he's going to be gone but um that could you could probably argue is a little bit of a clumsy stroke in the story because if you are coming into the bat titles fresh with face to face uh and you don't really have any emotional investment in what the friendship used to be between batman and harvey dent this could potentially fall pretty flat for you sure Um, i think for people like us there's already a built-in reverence for for that partnership so maybe that's where some of the emotional punch could come from. But even then, it doesn't hit very hard. Yeah. Well, I think there's, you could maybe call it an exposition chapter 
I think it is Batman 653 that is basically all Harvey talking to Two-Face, talking through where his mind's at and everything. But I I really like that issue. I like the the way that it's, you know, I mean, the, the first page is, let me see here, the layout of it and where the dialogue and following the dialogue is going like wavy back and forth as you're hearing him and he's, He's talking to Two Face, and you know, and through that, and you see that he's just kind of driven himself crazy, uh, like or like in anger with the wherever he's staying. Um, and he ta- you you just talk through his mental process to catch up to where he's at, and I think it Robinson really really nails it here to get us even more up to speed to by this issue's end. Uh, you know, drives him back to succumbing to the power of Two Face, in which, I mean, strange where your mind always goes. But as he's turning himself back into Two Face, I get like for some reason I got Terminator vibes of when the Terminator oh, yeah, goes to the yeah. hotel room and he cuts yeah. his eye out with the totally. uh, the scalpel, you know. And I'm and it's just like, oh man, that feels like the Terminator. But uh, well, and he's not screaming when he's pouring the the acid on his face, right? And cutting himself up, which pretty much. But also too, I would. Yeah, I would. Just too. saying, yeah, I don't I, need to act like I'm tough, but I would be terrible. I'm not a fan <laughs> of scalpels. <laughs> um, yeah, not really a big fan. No, no, we're meat sacks. We're gonna leak mm-hmm. out if we have scalpels come too close to us. But um, <laughs> really, when it comes to to Two Face. I don't know. It just, it feels to me like it was necessary to sort of get him back on the board in a more familiar capacity. Um, But we wouldn't even see him again for quite a while after this, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Like he didn't, I don't think he showed up at all in Morrison's run, which is kind of surprising because it seems Mm -hmm. like he used everybody. But um, Harvey, I think any Batman fan understands who has any semblance of familiarity with harvey dead that yeah your physical scars were healed i really don't think your mental ones are gone Mm -hmm. like there's they're so persistent and you kind of like them so are are we really like is two-face really gone at the beginning of the story was two-face really gone uh, during that year that he was watching Gotham for Batman or in Batman stead? I don't think so. Uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, it was a way for the two-faced consciousness to wedge himself uh, further into the psyche of Harvey. He was probably always there, just kind of latently watching for an opportunity to reassert himself. And that's what he does here. Um, and it is sad because it didn't need to happen but, uh, you know, he had a lot of bitterness. Like Batman even said, tell me that you're innocent. I'll, I'll back you. And Two-Face Harvey, his response was so weird. Yeah. To me, anyway, where he's, he's, he just says, uh, a true friend would believe. It's like he's looking yeah. for an excuse to, to not believe Batman, even though as a former DA, you should know that evidence dictates where the detective goes and the detective's at your door. Give him a reason to back you. And he didn't do it. And I don't think he wanted to. There's definitely like a correlation with Batman and Two-Face because you'd almost think the responsibility of being the the fill-in crime buster. Okay, was Harvey mentally able to distract himself and avoid two-face in his mind because he's got this mission or when batman's back two-face appears because there's something there of like he needs batman's attention too you know what i mean of and i don't think that that's necessarily like played up a lot in comics it's not like the joker's love and affinity for batman that's that's not what i'm saying but it's just something that just popped in my head there of it's subverted until Batman's there to witness it. And then it comes out again. Um, And I wonder if that was ever a thought in James Robinson's mind in with this story, because if it's not, I mean, it's the story still like, that's just something, a personal thing to think about. The story holds up whether it is or isn't. 
it's just a little extra baggage I brought, I brought to the table reading it this time. Yeah, but I think there is something there because Bullock gave literal service to that idea. I mean, before he and Batman sort of have their blow off and, and reset mm -hmm. their circumstances between each other, Bullock is kind of digging at him saying, this stuff only happens when you're around. True, you know? yeah. And so Robinson willfully put that in there, I'm sure, for a reason. And uh, I mean, whether or not Harvey Dent is someone who reacts as strongly to the presence of Batman as some of his other adversaries is... is probably debatable i mean two faces obsessions are well documented but they're also kind of all over the place and i don't know if two Face is necessarily as obsessed with batman himself as some of his other enemies are but mm -hmm. um batman is a lightning rod for extreme personalities you know whether that's for one reason or another is debatable in the universe um but it it happens and if the two-faced personality I don't know. I, I feel like the two-faced personality, if he is like a conniving observer in the back of Harvey's mind, he is trying to find that opportunity to reassert himself. And I think Batman provides it. There's enough history that he can exploit with Harvey himself uh -huh. that uh, he could potentially have Harvey hand him the keys again to the, to the, to the, to the car of his mind, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring up a uh, quick with the art. And I said that we'd mention this later on. So it's a dark book. Uh, it's printed. I can't remember because I haven't read the physical issues of this. I don't know in how long I've always grabbed my trade, but it's like printed on, like it's like black paper. It's almost like the animated series approach of it's like, right, it yeah. seems like it's black paper printed on. It but is there more is, like newsprinty. Yeah. Yeah. And the fourth chapter, so Batman 652, when Batman, Gordon, and Robin, and I think Bullock are all at the like at the beach, it is nearly impossible to see. I don't know if yours is the same way. Let me go to that page real fast. So that's your 88. Page yeah. 88. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. The cover with Robin. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. that well because I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think... Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, it, the the individual issues, I think most of the individual issues around that time were on the glossier paper. Okay. So the trade being on like the flatter kind of newsprint. Which I love this paper more than the glossy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it, the glossy, if I'm remembering right, did bring out some of these darker details, but you're certainly okay. right. I mean, it's, um, it is darker. And I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, though. I mean, the um, the flatter paper, especially in stories having to do with Gotham, just makes more sense. Um, and and I mean, compare it to page 11, where that's KG Beast uh, murder scene. That at right. first was a little dark. And I'm like, oh, OK, but I can still kind of see it. Whereas there's like a red to help highlight some of the, the scene. Whereas in this, it's like blue to highlight dark blue to highlight black so then i this was a great reason to also check it out on hoopla i mean compared to digitally like i'm showing chris right now how bright and you can see what the hell is going on the highlights are far more visible. <laughs> even the colors are far more visible yeah you know, like so you I look know at the top of this page like you can't see any brown on the beach compared to the page you showed me digitally let me see yeah tim's screen at least is bright so that's not like a huge it's not a bugaboo it didn't ruin the story but it was for me there was a full-on trying to turn it away and toward the light like i can't see what is really happening here so okay I there's also, gordon <laughs> I, I also do think that there is something to be said about how that is a leonard kirk andy clark issue okay i feel like those ones are darker than the uh so the Batman and issues Don are Kramer issues. Okay. Yeah, like the Don Kramer issues. So for instance, uh in the first issue where Batman and Robin uh sh are revealed on page 20 for the first time uh and and come on top of the bat signal. 
it very much do, i'm glad you brought up the animated series because a hallmark of the the art style of that of course as we know from eric radomsky is that the black paper was drawn around with lighter colors and it was defined by shadow and i feel like um kirk and uh clark define their work far more by shadow and mm -hmm. accenting the shadow than don kramer does it feels like don kramer is a little bit more traditional in his approach to rendering things and it does seem like on his issues the action is clearer in that respect at least on this paper um but yeah i did, i think i read the the issue that you pointed out digitally so it didn't jump out at me but yeah you're okay. you're definitely right but it does seem like there's a little bit of a dividing line in terms of the styles between both of the artistic teams that's your prime opportunity to say you're wrong ryan you're wrong and you're not wrong <laughs> though that's the thing and i know look, look i know better than to say you're wrong you, you think things out very wrong um no chris is saying is not saying i'm wrong because i haven't paid him yet if i'd have paid him by now <laughs> yeah it, it has snuck out uh before we we start to head into like the favorites is there any aspect of the story we haven't or anything at all that we haven't mentioned yet that you'd like to bring up jason bard jason bard Sock it to us. Um, yeah, I just, it was such a cool idea. So the core uh, concept when it comes to the invocation of Jason Bard in the story is that he's going to be Batman's daytime detective partner, basically. Uh, Bard is a character who's been around for a long time, like uh, since the, I think the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't really been very aware of him. I think he showed up. In, we talked about Batman Eternal earlier. He showed up in there as a as a police officer. And this story makes reference to previous time he served as a police officer before an injury sidelined him. But um, we never really saw the idea of Batman having a daytime collaborator followed up on really ever again i don't think mm. um and i thought it was just such a cool concept because it's like his work really doesn't ever stop and robinson did a solid job in setting up bard's detective ability uh not to come anywhere close to being like a, a rival of batman's necessarily but he's very competent and he's methodical in a way that obviously batman respects and appreciates there's a point in the story where Batman rattles off some other detectives that he probably would have preferred to work with before getting to Jason Bard, but they were unavailable. Ralph Dibney, because he was dead. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, It was just, a, I, I just thought it, it brought a cool dynamic and even more so than some of the other things that we talked about that maybe weren't paid off later. That is most definitely true of this. Like you never even catch a whiff of Jason Bard operating during the daytime in either of his succeeding runs and Grant Morrison on Batman or in Paul Dini on detective. And even years after that. Nice. Yeah. I'm, his name is familiar to me because I know that he has um, popped up with stories focused with Barbara Gordon and like Batgirl stories and stuff. And I think in Batgirl year one, he's mentioned um, that's where my, that's where my head goes when hearing him, but I did really like his scene. I mean, was it his, his intro in this story where he's in bed with the, the woman and he talks to Batman has a whole scene. And then at the end she comes like, she wakes up and comes out to the room and he's like, Batman, you know, there you go. Here's a murderer. So the, the, other... the police department. Anyway, can <laughs> yeah. you can you take her with you? And then I, and then, I couldn't remember. I didn't peek at the end, but when he's, it's implied that he's shot by the tally man. Uh, I was like, ah, oh, damn. Well, that sucks. Wait, I don't think he, I don't think he died. Well, we didn't see the body. So let's <laughs> see. And then, ah, okay. He didn't die. Got it. Um, but I mean, he serves a great purpose in this for, you know, he does detective work. He helps figure out that it's not, it's not Two-Face who murdered people. It was tally man because of the great white shark um who to me you know when i when i read it, i was like i don't know who the hell great white shark is at all <laughs> <laughs> the first time i read it um 
so yeah he plays he plays an important part too so yeah it's, it's another b list some c list villains are being murdered is the main and then there's so many like smaller smaller plot threads uh in this story yeah and uh you know i mentioned before how james robinson is a workhorse and this is one Mm -hmm. of the reasons why because he does like the fun thing i would imagine at least i've never worked in comics but i would imagine one of the fun things of working in comics is the idea that you're helping to build a tapestry for someone to pick something up and take it forward yeah and he robinson set up a lot of pieces here for people to run with if they wanted to And unfortunately, a lot of them just didn't want to for for one reason or another. I like the idea. I mean, I'm look, I'm biased for the heroes in this story. What a shock. But I like (laughs) uh, Batman's allies being bolstered, you know, like as as powerful as Batman tends to be in stories in terms of his effectiveness and operating in Gotham City. Like, I'm not someone who chafes at the idea of him having a whole network of people to keep Gotham in line. I like that. I think it's cool. And I think it speaks to his competence in in staying on top of everything as he would want to do normally. Uh, it's one of the strengths of DC Universe Batman to me. So the idea of, of this was kind of an intoxicating one at the time. I thought it was just cool. It opened up a lot of potential storytelling possibilities, but nothing happened with it. No. Kind of sucks. gone but not forgotten jason bard no 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 and i mean i don't even know if he's really appeared since the end of batman eternal like he's kind of back on the shelf again and has been for several years so i'll make a triumphant return yeah someone pick up jason bard make good on this yeah uh if you're okay with it you want to move into some favorites sure all right Chris Clow, what was your favorite part of Batman face to face? It's a tie Mm -hmm. between Batman and Robin's arrival on the bat signal and the moment at the very end where Tim hugs him. Um, Those were like the big, I feel like the story is really well balanced. Yeah. by being anchored by those kind of emotional beginning and end points nice okay uh, i'm gonna follow suit here of the rooftop scene of their return uh i like because just the fact of like there's there's good art of the spread you called a game um <laughs> but i mean and this this just shows that i love solo batman stories that doesn't mean that i don't like robin perfect in how what people always say the point of robin is of the lightness part so you have this new uh police officer and harper officer harper there talking to batman he doesn't say anything but robin is there to make sure that she knows he heard you he like he's the light there in that scene too you know cheese ball but i'm like I like that. It gives me the good feelings. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. And I mean, there's also another moment that stands out to me as a favorite, even though it's just like super innocuous. That kind of jumps on what you said, because yeah, at the beginning, Batman is kind of like situation normal, at least at first. It kind of appears mm-hmm. that he's still pushing people away a little bit more and and being guarded. But there's a moment where they're overlooking Arnold Wesker's body after he's been murdered. Yeah. And Robin catches that there is uh, spaghetti grease on his fingers. And Batman yes. says, good catch. Like, yeah. That was like, oh my God, he actually complimented. So it was his, it was Robin, but still he complimented somebody. Like, we haven't seen that in a long time. I mean, him just out in the field. Flashes being... of Batman forever. No, <laughs> partners and handshakes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was just like, that that to me especially at the time i read it having absorbed so much of his history up until that moment it's like wow he really has become rested and he's ready to get back to work that's cool yeah uh how about a favorite panel Ooh, um 
You know, know these it, are coming, but when everything's recording, it's like it's, it's a whole different ball game. It it, oh, it always is. It always is. You said no curveball. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I think it's that one I showed you of Gordon and Batman standing in front of the bat signal in the first issue. Nice. I, I know we're we're kind of waiting things in the first issue, but it is solid. Like it's a really good, uh, nice kind of declarative statement about what kind of story this is going to be. Mm-hmm. And Batman and Gordon together again in front of the bat signal for the first time in a long time. Um, it's a cool visual, and the silhouettes just stand out to me. It's just definitive Batman. Uh, mine comes in part six, Batman 653, page 124 of Harvey standing in front of after the destruction of his room, and he's staring into the broken mirror which is of two-face set it so let's see 108 episodes you remove the monthly wrap-ups with pete we're down into i don't know 80 something episodes and i've probably 80 times said when i pick a favorite panel it's if i see an image and i can create a story around it and that to me is like that is harvey dent's character pre-post acid face it is relatable on a human level it's the whole reason the character was created of that duality fight of dr jekyll mr hyde you know the the man in the mirror um i don't know that that image itself in it's a reflection on batman as well like i don't know um that image i just think that's a really good one that's two-faced it's harvey dent you don't need context for that image see and this is how you show the acumen for being the man in the chair on this show because (laughs) that's that's a that's a great point i mean it's a it's a really nice and kind of poetic encapsulation of who harvey dent is and i just picked like oh i like this picture of batman that's usually what i always do cool (laughs) but i actually tonight watched the the lego batman movie and man in the mirror was on my mind so (laughs) batman said that um yeah which is it really blows my mind that it's not an image of batman or gotham city or the bat cave or anything like that um there's just i don't know there's a good 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 solid artists in this book all around yep uh would you like to see batman face to face adapted in animation Ooh. i don't think so okay i don't think like granted though let me qualify that just by saying that if you present most mm-hmm. batman comic stories to me i'm probably not going to want to see them adapted only because like I mean, I told you how much I love year one. Mm-hmm. I don't really like the year one movie very much. I don't feel like it came anywhere close to getting the feel right of the grandness of the storytelling, even if it is kind of an intimate story in and of itself. Um, and a story like this, especially with one of the things that we talked about before earlier on the show, Uh, about just like embracing the strengths of the medium and sort of the weirdness of some of the characters that are less likely to be adapted in other media Mm -hmm. um that is in the book's favor but um also too i don't know like even just in terms of the way that some of those animated movies have cast the characters i actually really like brian cranston as gordon in the year one movie but by and large I don't know. It seems too much to me like the animated movies have Batman performers that are doing a voice and aren't necessarily giving a lot of emotional credence to what they're saying outside of like Kevin Conroy. Um, But even Conroy, like depending on the movie or depending on the show, sometimes like if he's doing a line that has been in a book before, it doesn't sound as good as it does when I read it. And that's a personal thing. So (laughs) I don't. So this has the background fights are make this story almost made for animation in the sense of 
a 70, 75 minute movie. It's like, we need our action beats. Well, here you go. Poison Ivy takes over a building. There's an action beat. Uh, Mad Hatter, Batman and Robin are fighting Mad Hatter and his kids. There's an action beat. They're fighting like the scarecrow hallucination. It's the, the story is not about those action scenes though. In which I don't know as much as this is like a restart for to do a movie of this you need harvey dent as harvey dent and recovered from two-face i think for this to work adapted um i'd welcome the challenge uh i don't need it adapted though yeah it's fine how it is yeah i mean maybe was the healed two-face part of the hush movie i can't even remember I only saw it once. It's it's I've only watched that like three times. I do like it. Um, I definitely have nits to pick, but sure. I don't remember. A yeah, whole I mean, lot from the movie, like a shared universe kind of a thing. It could it could technically work. Yeah, um, I don't even know if they're doing that shared universe in in the movies anymore, honestly. But, um. Yeah, I, I think that its ideal form is is in the book. So yeah. I would just encourage people, hey, read. Just read, 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 read more Batman read comics. <laughs> read, more, read more comics. Where read more comics. That before. Yeah. Uh, is there, what are your final thoughts? Anything you haven't said that you'd like to say about Batman face the face? Um. It's underrated, really. It's kind of treated these days as a, a footnote, even though I feel like, certainly for the time and for the era of Batman stories that this probably kicked off, um, it was a really good way to sort of set the table for what would come in the future. Um, not just in terms of giving Batman a more heroic countenance coming out of uh, everything that he had experienced between uh, Bruce Wayne murderer and infinite crisis, but um, just in terms of, of getting the, the pieces of Gotham back in place. It's not a story that I understand why people don't really think of it all that often it's not like it's a story that has the Joker or that has a lot of other A-list villains as we discussed before, but I do think that it's just a good solid way to, uh, to absorb uh, sort of the chaos that Batman tries to control because kind of what you were talking about before in terms of uh, a lot of the disparate action beats that take place like that's Batman's life. Like he, even though he's dealing with these things that don't necessarily all connect together, he's still dealing with them and he's trying to apply his skills as best as possible in his network of allies. The character dynamics are all very clear and very strong. Um, it's just a good solid story uh, to absorb if you like your Batman of a more heroic variety. Um, and it feels like the return to form that the character needed certainly at the time um, and now you know so many years later it just feels like a nice solid story that probably doesn't get the attention that it deserves especially like I'm surprised this isn't discussed more among Tim Drake fans because obviously Robin's not like a f main focus of the story but he is a big one mm -hmm. and it does a lot for him in in giving service to so much of the journey that he's gone through and Batman's recognition of it. And uh, so in that respect, especially for people who like the Batman Robin dynamic and most specifically the Bruce Wayne, Tim Drake dynamic, uh, this is definitely a story worth reading. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if you want importance in Batman history, I mean, there's, like you just said, the adoption of Tim Drake, this, unless I'm forgetting, was the last time that Harvey Dent was just Harvey Dent. Yeah. I think, I think so. he's been Two-Face ever since the story uh, in comics. 
so I mean those two I mean historical moments in it of itself but also just as an eight issue story I mean you get sucked in and it flies by you you'll breeze through this um it's not like really heavy in the sense of like dense um and that's why you could I could have probably read the whole thing in one sitting if I'd have had the time um because once you start you don't necessarily want to stop I think it's I think it's a very entertaining story um it's a good picking up point you I mean like you brought up and we've mentioned a few times I mean the book basically starts as like hey clean sweep for all of us uh there's been a year where we don't know what happened so we're all catching up from this point on and um I just think that it is it's a it's a good story and it's entertaining so and it's it's easy to find I mean you can get used copies anywhere now it's on DC Universe Infinite it's on Hoopla uh check back issue bins of comics because it didn't light up I don't think it lit up anything so it's not like oh if you want to buy the original issues you better cough up some bucks it's you can find it so Batman face to face yeah I'm saying that to Chris face to face about (laughs) face to face about two face and I mean it just kicks off such a cool point in Batman's publication history that I have such reverence for there's and there's even some artistic commonality because Don Kramer would go on to do some issues of Detective with Paul Dini, not the least of which being Sleigh Ride, which I think is one of the coolest Robin Joker stories that's ever been committed to any yeah. medium. Uh, it's um, a yearly, it's a Christmas read. It's on yeah. the, the list of every Christmas, Detective Same 826. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Detective 826 and Holiday Nights are two things that I go to every holiday season. And Batman Noel, right? Yeah, maybe. Okay. I'll say it then. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. I like, (laughs) I like that story a lot. I I, I do check into it on the holiday season. I I don't say I do it every year, but it it makes it into the rotation. So I like Chris, I'm telling you it's Batman Noel every Christmas, right? (laughs) All right. Look, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. The whole recording. You didn't tell me I was wrong. (laughs) You're a gentleman. Uh, no reason to do so. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you, sir, for coming on, talking uh, some good, ba- some Batman goodness. Fill me in on some info that was that I didn't have available in my brain archives. Um, this is a treat having you come on the show. I enjoy talking to Chris Clow about comics. It's a great time. I enjoy talking to you. Thank you very much for for having me on. Like I said, this is a this is a fantastic show that you have here. So oh, yes. getting an invitation was uh, was a, 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 it was something I was hoping would happen, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. And again, you know, just what you built is spectacular, and oh, thank it's you. all oriented around not just the love of a great medium, but the love of the greatest character in fiction exactly what i was thinking greatest character in fiction um yes the the invitation will come your way again to hopefully come back on this show but if people want to follow you because they aren't right now why don't you tell guide them chris clow sure uh you can find me on twitter at chris clow c-h-r-i-s-c-l-o-w um the most regular podcast that I participate in at the moment is called Discovery Debrief, which is dedicated to the Star Trek franchise. There is an excellent show on the air right now on Paramount Plus called Star Trek Strange New Worlds that we're diving into in its first season here. But good group of people, and we just kind of unpack whatever's going on with Star Trek, which is a lot right now. Um and of course, Ryan also already mentioned Comic Binge that I co-host with my buddy Paul Herman. He's been doing a couple of Star Wars things lately that I have not been on because of scheduling and and some other things. But um, you know, we'll be back to it soon. We're actually in the middle of doing kind of an Infinite Crisis deep dive. Uh, we just did an episode about Countdown to Infinite Crisis and the OMAC project, um, and we're doing the next Infinite Crisis episode about the lead up to the main story that involves Superman and Wonder Woman. We'll also touch on the lead up that involves the Justice League sometime after that. And then we'll do the main series. And conceivably after that, we might be doing 52. So Ryan, if you want to talk 52, that would be a good reason to. Hey, hey now. 
excellent yeah you guys have been uh courteous and and had me on the comic binge a couple times and i think by golly we're gonna get that geiger show <laughs> happening at some at some point that's um, something to look forward to definitely yeah and uh yeah mr herman is he's the one that's that's keeping me informed on that of it, it's coming and i said cool you tell me when and we'll make it happen so yes do check out the comic binge uh check out chris's twitter uh a lot of good stuff happening you can check out the batman book club's twitter at the batman bc also on instagram at the batman bc for latest episode drops upcoming episodes and sometimes even some getaways getaways giveaways there we go i'm not giving away getaways Uh, that would be pretty impressive i think i'd get a big following if uh, i was giving away (laughs) getaways cruise the batman yeah (laughs) wow you have to listen to me talk about batman comics the whole time though that's the that's the bargain uh if you have any questions or comments or anything at all batman you want to write in you can do that the batmanbc at gmail.com make sure to subscribe to the youtube channel the batman book club especially because peter vera and i his name sounds familiar doesn't it uh we're going to be doing something we're going to kick off something this month on the youtube channel so you'll want to check that out uh if you want to support the show there's a variety of ways you can do that like i said at the top patreon.com slash the batman bc you can go to t public and uh, get merchandise of a t-shirt, hoodie, uh, notebook, onesie for your little one. There's actually a 35% off sale going on right now if you'd like to go there. Uh, also, sponsor Manscapes. Go to manscaped.com, 20% off, plus free shipping with the code BATBOOK, B-A-T-B-O-O-K. But lastly, if you want to support the show, you don't want to spend any money at all, that's 100% A-OK. You could actually just rate and review the show, and that helps the show a lot, whether you use uh, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts, just rate and review the show. The more abuse it gets, the more it helps spread the word. And as we all know, the word is panic. So for the gentleman known as Chris Clow, I am Ryan Lauer. And until next time, read my panic comics. <laughs>